Okay. So welcome to uh, this new installment of the uh, Institute of Astrophysics seminar series. Today, we are very, very glad to have with us uh, Dr. Renske Smith. Uh, Renske uh, is a, a well-known and uh, expert in uh, galaxy evolution, especially in, uh, in galaxies at the epoch of uh, reionization. Uh, she got her uh, uh, PhD in astronomy uh, at the Leiden University in 2014. Uh, a thesis that uh, was awarded actually the Merak Prize by the European Astronomical Society for the best thesis in observational astrophysics. Uh, after that, she moved to uh, Durham University uh, with an ERC research fellow. And after that, she got a NYWO Rubicon Fellow at the University of Cambridge and later a Newton Cabley Fellow at the same institution in Cambridge. And since 2021, she is an associate professor at uh, uh, the Astrophysics Research Institute at the Liverpool John Moores University, which uh, 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 she holds together with a roster for a fellow. So uh, I think uh, that's an impressive background. And uh, we, uh, I'm very, we are very glad to have you here uh, today with us. Uh, so Renske will talk about, uh, will provide an alpha view of galaxies at the epoch of reionization. And uh, whenever you are ready, please go ahead. Ah, oh, thanks so much, and thanks for thanks for having me. Um, so yeah, I typically work at the Redshift frontier of galaxy formation studies. So really, Redshift six or higher. Um, and of course, this field is about, you know, in just a few months time about to completely change with, with James Webb. Um, but in the last five years, I think most, almost all progress has been made with, with ALMA. So, um, you know, we, for a long time, this field was, um, something we only studied with the Hubble Space Telescope or maybe Spitzer Space Telescope and ALMA has come along and already given us maybe a glimpse of what, what we might expect with JW as well. So, um, it would be nice to, to talk about what sort of what's the, the, the cutting edge of the field at the moment. So let's talk about um, sort of the big picture of the early universe first. So um, if we look at the timeline of the early universe, we know that a uh, few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang recombination happens. Um, that's the start of the dark ages before the first stars are formed. And it takes a few hundred million years roughly um, for the first stars or population three stars to form. So somewhere around Redshift 15, maybe, we're not completely sure. Um, and these first stars are thought to be really heavy, so they explode as supernova really click quickly. And as they explode, they start enriching the gas around them with um, more heavy elements. These heavy elements help to cool the gas further. And so um, you know, this causes a lot more star formation, and the, the formation of the first galaxy follows the formation of the first stars pretty, pretty quickly. And as these first galaxies start to then grow um, and evolve, they are thought to start um, reionizing the um, intergalactic medium, the neutral hydrogen in the IGM. And this process is thought to be complete at Reg of six or so, which is one billion years after the Big Bang. So that sort of that first billion years, there's a lot happening there. And that's really the focus of my research. Um, and we're very broadly trying to answer very basic questions such as, how early do the first stars form? How do galaxies evolve in the first billion years? And what sources are responsible for cosmic realization? Um, so if you look at um, you know, galaxies across cosmic history, one of the challenges that we have at uh, very high redshift is that we don't have a lot of probes to look at them. So this is sort of illustrated here with this um, a Dow diagram. So the, the star formation rate density uh, as a function of redshift. Um, and if you look at uh, most of cosmic time, we can measure star formation in, in various different ways. So red tends to show um, infrared tracers, mid and far infrared tracers of the star formation rates. Then um, green tends to show H alpha star formation rate tracers, and blue shows rest frame UV, um, unobscured um, star formation, direct, the direct light from O and B stars. Um, and so for most, most of cosmic time of the Redshift 3, we have all these different tracers which sort of show us a consistent picture of the universe. 
Um, then as we go to higher redshifts, we only really have one tracer um, reliably, um, which is the, the rest ring UV, so the unobscured star formation, which is seen, for example, um, in many, many galaxies with the white Fugat Mer 3 on board Mert Hubble. So how do we um, select or find galaxies um, based on their rest ring UV uh, light, based on unobscured star formation? Um, so we use the well-known Lyman break technique, which basically um, takes advantage of the 912 to 1216 angstrom uh, break. Um, and here you see a galaxy that is moving from RGF4 to RGF12 or so. Um, and below here you see a number of um, filters on board HST, either from the ACS instrument or the white field camera 3. And you can see how, you know, because of this sharp break in the flux where um, hydrogen starts to ab absorbs the, the, the radiation, um, inside the ISM, um, we, can, we can get this really clean um, selection criteria to look at for this, this dropouts um, of the flux at different redshifts. So we're very good at um, getting um, consecutive samples in consecutive redshifts. Um, and this technique has been very successful. It's, for example, found um, what we think is still the most distant galaxy known, so GNC 11 at redshift 11. Um, but also, it's we actually have some reasonable statistical samples from RGF4 to RGF8 or so. So at RGF4, we still have thousands of galaxies that we can identify if you look at all the, um, the HST deep fields that are available at the moment. And this drops off to maybe samples of a few hundred um, towards, towards higher redshift and just a handful at RGF10. Um, so once we have these statistical samples, sort of the most basic physical um, property that we can um, make is the, the, the luminosity function, or in this case, um, star formation rate function. So I just apply um, some kind of dust correction that, I, that is based on the, the, the UV color of these galaxies. But basically it's the, the number density of galaxies at a certain star formation rate. And um, the star formation rate functions um, change quite rapidly from redshift eight here in yellow to redshift four. So what this tells you is that there's a smooth, very rapid buildup at any fixed star formation rate. And so um, what I'm mainly going to focus on in this talk is um, the properties that we can um, figure out with ALMA from sort of the bright end. So galaxies around the knee or um, uh, L star uh, or brighter. Um, we would love to know more about all the galaxies below here and the faint galaxies. These are thought to be maybe more important um, cumulatively to bring about cosmic organization, but they're at the moment just still too faint um, to target with um, instruments like ALMA. So this is sort of the sweet spot where we can really make a lot of progress. Um, so just let me just summarize a few sort of, the, of the basic properties that were established with um, HST and Spitzer of these, these sort of galaxy samples before we get into um, you know, how ALMA is changing the view of these galaxies. So one of the basic properties is the colors of these galaxies in the restream UV, um, parameterized by beta here, but the main thing is the blue galaxies are here, red galaxies are here, and then the beta of minus three, you have sort of a maximally young, um, you know, instant burst um, of star formation that's completely metal poor and completely dust free. And if we look at typical galaxies, say at Rich of seven, they are only just a little bit redder than this sort of maximally um, blue color. So typically galaxies seem to be, um, you know, relatively blue, which might, uh, you know, from which you might derive that if, you know, these galaxies with modest ages and the dust and the UV is ascospatial, that there's not a lot of dust present yet in the early universe. Um, that could be a conclusion. Um, and then another basic property is the sizes, at least in the UV of these, these sources. So typically, blood and break galaxies tend to look compact, um, you know, centrally concentrated, um, sort of single little clumps um, that even at edge of seven are no larger than one kiloparsec in their effective radius. And so that's sort of what we can establish with HST. And then Spitzer has fortunately given us um, you know, a lot more information as well. Spitzer is the only um, instrument that with sort of the, the most sensitive bands, the frequency of 4.5 micron bands, the IREC uh, bands, 
is able to sort of probe the rest frame optical light of these galaxies. Okay, this is still quite challenging if you look at uh, Lyman Bright galaxy um, detected by JGST, and you then follow it up with Spitzer, which has to be a very deep um, observation. Um, this allows you allows the very sources to blend very easily because of the difference in the BSF between HGC and Spitzer. But if you correct for this, if you sort of remove um, the contamination from neighboring sources, we can start to learn something about the restrain optical light of Lyman Bright galaxies. And that I'm, I'm showing here, um, one of the real surprises when we first started doing really deep studies with Spitzer of, of Lyman Bright galaxies at Project 7, say, is that they have quite extreme colors in the restroom optical. So if you see an H-band, so the restroom UV um, with HST of, of a galaxy, and then in the 3.6 micron band, there's this huge boost in the flux, and this flux completely disappears at 4.5 micron. Right? Then we see this in modest samples of galaxies, so you know, dozens, number of dozens of galaxies. Um, and so the only way we can interpret these huge um, these these flux boosts or these, these extreme colors in restroom optical is by assuming that there has to be um, very high equivalent with line emitters, line emission. So this is the typical SED of, uh, of one of these galaxies. So HST gives you the restroom UV, this is the line and break. And then the restroom optical, there's in particular the oxygen three plus H beta line that really boosts the 3.6 micron flux um, of this particular galaxy. Right, and so the equivalent width that you um, infer from this boost is, is about 1,000 angstrom, so for the O3 doublet plus H beta. And these kind of equivalent widths in the local universe are really rare, sometimes only found in maybe AGN or something. Um, but in Lyman Bright galaxies at Redshift 7, we see these in quite a big fraction, 30 to 50% of all Lyman Bright selected sources. Right? So it's not obvious that that many of the galaxies would have an AGN in there. And so it's most likely something about tells us about the star formation in these galaxies. So, for example, they have hard radiation fields because they're metal poor, or they have very high specific star formation in very young ages. So, just to put that sort of in a cosmological context, if we look at how different the universe is at Reg of Zero and Reg of Five, I'm showing here a cosmological um, simulation of the same volume. Um, and here we're looking at the gas density. Um, and at Reg of Zero, you can see that. You know, um, most gas is concentrated around a few galaxies um, with a lot of empty voids around it. And the universe at Redshift 5 here is, is a stark contrast with Redshift 0. You see that you know, there's many more galaxies that are still um, rapidly agreeing gas um, around them, so that um, the gas density field is very different. And so um, because this um, specific accretion rate of, of the gas is a little high, very high, this results in a very high specific star formation rate um, if that gas is constantly converted into stars, right? So that's sort of the underlying reason of why some of these properties are, are very different in high redshift galaxies. Okay, so this is sort of, you know, the, the picture we've been able to establish of these high redshift galaxies. Um, and then, you know, now Alma is online and it's starting to actually give us some of the real information on the dust and on some of the emission lines in these galaxies. And that, you know, it's really changing our view. So I'm going to split it up in two sections. First, I'm going to talk us about ALMA as a redshift machine, where we've made a lot of progress. And I'm going to talk a bit more about the physical properties that we learned about sort of the first pilot samples of these galaxies. So why were we originally hoping that ALMA might be um, help us as a, as a redshift machine? Um, if we look at galaxies, especially network organization, we have this problem that there's very few spectroscopic confirmations. So the, the gray points here indicate sources that are galaxy candidates, basically, that are selected on the Lyman Bright technique. And then the sources that we know that are spectroscopically confirmed on the squares. And so you can see, especially about Archive six and a half or so, we're really only down to a handful of galaxies um, that have spectroscopic confirmations, right? And so the main line that is used for spectroscopic confirmation is the Lyman Alpha line, um, which is you know, a bit of a tricky line, particularly in the um, epochronization. You know, even though we've seen it out pretty far at uh, 3.6, the only way that we believe um, Lyman Alpha can reach us deep in the epochronization is because there's large ionized bubbles. So um, in general, in epochronization, Lyman Alpha will be scattered um, by the by the neutral 
uh, gas and in intergalactic medium in that organization, except when there is a, a bubble large enough, an ionized bubble, that the line can redshift um, while traveling through the bubble before it hits the IGM. Uh, and that would allow it you know, to redshift out of resonance and actually get to it. But yes, you might imagine there's only, you know, by definition, there will only be a handful of galaxies um, where we can ever um, observe Lyman Alpha. So this is potentially where Alma comes in. If we look at spectral energy distribution of a, a typical redshift seven galaxy, but we place that at redshift zero. Um, obviously, at low redshifts, one of the best ways of spectroscopy confirming galaxies is in the, in the optical windows. In the background, I show the, the transmission of the atmosphere and the different windows, so the optical window, the, the millimeter window, and the radio window um, of the atmosphere. Um, then if we move this, um, this galaxy to redshift 4, it becomes fainter, but also it obviously um, moves to the red. And we see that a lot of these um, really nice lines that we normally use for spectroscopic confirmations have moved into the mid infrared where they're um, inaccessible to us from the ground, at least. Um, there's still, of course, the Lyman alpha line, it's redshift 4, that's pretty OK still. Um, then if we, if we get to redshift 7, we get this problem. Um, first of all, Lyman alpha moves into the near infrared, but also the, the IGM starts to be an issue. Um, at the same time, um, around this redshift, C plus is suddenly one of, you know, one of the brightest lines in the entire um, spectral energy distribution of galaxies and suddenly moved into the submillimeter window, right into the middle. It should be really nicely accessible by um, telescopes like ALMA. Um, so what are the challenges of, of um, doing spectroscopic redshift confirmations with ALMA? So this is a spectroscopic um, a redshift confirmation from a really bright, really lensed submillimeter galaxy. Um, and what you can see is that ALMA only has a very narrow range of frequencies that it can see in one setup. So every single color here is a different setup. So for a bright galaxy like this, it's easily feasible to do many different spectral scans uh, and therefore create a large um, scan, a broad range of frequencies for different lines. Obviously, as you go to which of seven, and we're looking at these typical lemon break galaxies, sort of normal-ish galaxies in the epoch of realization, um, these sources are so much fainter in that every single tuning and every single setup of ALMA is really expensive. And so we can't really afford these long spectral scans. And so what is, you know, so we needed a, a trick in order to be able to actually start spectroscopic confirming these Lyman break galaxies. And in particular, we use this um, the information that we got it from, from Spitzer, knowing that all the, you know, the typical um, mission line in these galaxies is quite strong. So how that works, that trick that we use is that at of 6.5. Um, you can see the two Spitzer filters, 3.6 and 4.5 micron. Um, and then this redshift, both O3 and H alpha, contaminate each of the Spitzer bands. So you typically get only weak, um, weak colors in Spitzer. And then slightly higher redshift, 6.8, H-alpha moves out of the 4.5 micron bands, but O3 still contaminates the 4.5, 4.6, 3.6 micron band. And so you get this really blue IREC, Spitzer IREC signature. Slightly higher redshift again, O3 moves to the 4.5 micron band, um, and you get this very red Spitzer IREC signature. Right. And so these, these color signatures are very important to um, get really accurate um, photometric redshifts, and that allows us to do a very short scan. So we were first able to do this um, a, few, for, uh, a few years ago. Um, we were able to spectroscopically confirm the first UV selected galaxies in the epoch of organization with ALMA. Um, so this is an example of the probability distribution of the redshift that we had for this galaxy. So using only the HST information, this galaxy was anywhere between redshift six and redshift nine. And then we folded in the, the Spitzer IRAC information and that sort of narrowed down the redshift to redshift 6.6 to 6.9 or so. And so we did really short, nice ALMA scans, um, but relatively deep. Um, and we were able to, to get two really nice lines of redshift 6.8. So we've since been able to also um, get line sets um, of the O3 line, so the second brightest line is millimeter, um, in some cases even brighter than, than C plus, um, though it's accessible in bent eight for ALMA, which is a bit uh, tricky, but still um, it's really nice, you know, 
for high register people, you know, we're used to having one, maybe five sigma line with Lyme and alpha to be able to have two, five to 10 sigma detections of two individual lines and really robustly have established a redshift is very rare. And it's very unique that ALBA has been able to give us this and actually be able to robustly um, confirm galaxies in network configuration. So what you're seeing here is um, narrow bands of the ALBA data cubes and here an overlay of the, the contours on top of the lemon break galaxy identified in the HST image um, for both C plus and for the O3. Right, so these are nice, you know, I think the, the contours go up to um, nine sigma or so. So they're nice, robust detections. So there's been a number of other really nice uh, spectroscopic confirmations, um, sometimes at really um, uh, impressively high redshifts. So for example, this um, O3 detection in a lens galaxy at redshift 9.1 between um, the lens and cluster max 1149, and another uh, lens galaxy also confirmed with O3, and redshift 8.3 um, behind the cluster, April 2744. So Alma had this really great start of, you know, really starting, starting off as a redshift machine. But the real question is how are we going to take, how are we going to go from uh, a few galaxies like this to actual galaxy samples? Because for this, our study, what we did is we took um, we unlensed galaxies, but we took all the white, sort of wide scandals. Um, HST data available and pick the brightest objects, basically. And so, you know, there's not a lot of bright HST selected galaxies like this um, on the sky anymore. Um, for these clusters, uh, lens galaxies are really rare. So these were intrinsically fainter galaxies, but they were um, very brightly lensed. And there's really only a handful of these kind of sources. So we ran a few more pilots. Um, to see how we can expand the samples of um, some millimeter um, selected galaxies. So this is one um, pilot that we ran that's a paper that's been submitted by my student in Liverpool, um, Stephen Mullingham. Um, so we looked at the brightest lens um, lemon bright galaxy that we knew in the Northern Hemisphere, and this time targeted with NOEMA. And because this lemon bright galaxy has been known to be brightly lensed, it's been targeted many times with, for example, the CAC telescope to find lemon alpha and a number of other UV lines, um, but none of these were successful. Also, Plateau de Boer had an unsuccessful search for C+. But now Noema is a lot more sensitive, so we tried again, and we finally were able to get a spectroscopic redshift for the first time for this source of the redshift of 6 million. So, you know, for as long as galaxies are bright enough, also in the Northern Hemisphere, for these kind of unique targets, um, we are able to now use this millimeter for spectroscopic confirmation. Then another pilot that we ran um, is this work led by students in Leiden, Sanders House. Um, and what we did was we took a sample of galaxies that were selected from ground-based imaging, so from the ultra vista surface in the, uh, in the broader cosmos field. Um, and out of the six galaxies that we chose, three were spectroscopically confirmed, with really nice, robust lines. And we see the, the narrow bands over the C+, and the three, four, and five sigma contours um, on top of the Lyman break galaxy. Um, so the fact that we were able to um, push beyond just HST selection into a much wider area gave us the confidence that maybe we could do this for an actual large sample. So a few lessons that we learned from the pilots that we ran um, is that typically if we take UV bright sources, we're much more likely to find a high C plus over LUV ratio, and therefore, um, you know, it's, it's a, which is um, important for a successful scan for C plus. But um, the scatter can be really large. So if we look at the C plus luminosities, a function of star formation rates in the local universe, we use the, um, a correlation that's um, pretty tight. Um, but this, in particular, if we um, infer star formation rates from the UV, so the unobscured star formation rate, we tend to have a really large scatter, as large as one dex. So the lesson there is, you know, C plus is either bright or it isn't. Um, and so scanning a large number of, of sources. Um, relatively shallow um, is likely to give us many more galaxies or more um, C plus detections, line detections, than um, going really deep on only a handful of sources. And this is sort of the philosophy that we use um, to set up um, the REBELS large program. So REBELS stands for Reunization Era Bright Emission Line Survey. Um, and it's a 70 hour um, and six and seven ALMA program targeting 40 bright lemon break galaxies above a virtue of 6.5. 
um, this is the, the core team. And so this is um, sort of the layouts of, of, the, of the programs. There is some HST, uh, we use all available HST data that there is, but there's not that much. Uh, and mainly we're using all these wide fields, such as the XMM and the Petro Vista sources. And one of the nice things is that um, even though James Webb is launching, the kind of sources that we're looking at, they're um, so much brighter than uh, what you find in, in what we will target with web. So this is an outline of the, the largest area um, survey that's approved on the, in the cycle one for web. And even that is you know, a small fraction of, of the area that we searched for, for getting these bright line and bright galaxies. So we're really covering a different parameter space that we fundamentally will be covering with James Webb um, with this survey. Um, and so um, of the um, 40 galaxies, 33 have now complete line scans after the first cycle. So we're hopefully in the next month or so, I think in March, we're hoping to complete it. But at the moment, 20 of the 33 sources that we um, that we completed have spectroscopic redshifts. So anywhere from redshift 6.5 to redshift 8 or so. And on top of that, there's a number of 13 continuum detections. Um, and one of the nice things is that we, whenever we find C+, we tend to also find the continuum. Right? And this tells us a lot about you know, why we've been um, finding this large scatter, um, for example, the C+, over UV ratio. If you look at the UV star formation rate, unobscured star formation rate of galaxies, and look at um, which galaxies in our survey were spectroscopically confirmed, we see no um, very clear trend. We see that you know faint UV faint galaxies are just as likely to be spectroscopically confirmed with C plus um, as bright ones. But if we fold in the, in the IR information estimate some infrared uh, star formation rate and get some estimate of the total star formation rate, you can see that it's clearly all the bright galaxies, all the high star formation rate galaxies that we are able to, to detect with C+. So basically by selecting in the UV, we have some chance of getting high star formation rate galaxies, but some will be dusty and some won't be. Um, and it's when we actually um, happen to be targeting a, a dusty galaxy is when we we're able to get nice C plus detections. So that's already telling us a, a bit about you know, the dust properties and the typical properties of iron break galaxies. Another really nice result that came out of the Rebel survey um, is this one um, published by Yoshi Furumoto in, in Nature this year. Um, so a number of the galaxies, two, two galaxies, um, lime and break galaxies that we found seem to have companions that are so-called HST dark galaxies. So here's the target galaxy, and then quite uh, close next to it, we see both C plus and the dust in a galaxy that has no counterpart in the rest frame um, UV, rest frame optical. And same for this galaxy. This is the target galaxy um, with a companion. And we really would have only found these galaxies um, because we we're doing a C plus scan, because often, um, you know, going deep on the dust here is, it makes it pretty hard to, to identify these sources. Particularly here, the dust isn't even that significant, but it's mainly the, the C plus that we can find as a source that makes it a, a robust detection in the epoch of realization of a completely dust obscured galaxy. Um, and what's the difference, you might wonder, between um, dust obscured galaxies like these and typical SMG galaxies, which we've known for a while exist, but we don't always know um, as to what redshifts they exist. Um, these galaxies tend to be like, 10 times fainter than standard SMGs um, of this epoch. So we're really looking at a, a much fainter sort of normal population of galaxies that are still completely dust obscured um, and that we're currently not seeing with our, with our HST selections or with our restream UV selection. So something, so a lot of work to do for James Webb here. I think, and for Alma as well. Let me move on for the last um, uh, section to a little bit, talking a little bit more about the physical properties of, of these galaxies. So we're obviously detecting a lot of C plus, um, which is a, an interesting, but also um, complex tracer of the standard medium to, to understand. So we know that C plus emerges, you know, in principle, single ionized carbon we can find in many phases of the, of the ISM ionized regions, but also um, uh, molecular gas, or the, the, the edges of 
like like clouds in the PDRs, um, you know, warm minus to medium, cold neutral medium. However, um, the one sort of mechanism that's most useful that for the excitation of superloss is the photoelectric photoelectric heating in PDRs. So often, at least in local galaxies, we believe that superloss is PDR dominate. Um, so we started sort of testing this as well for our Lyman Bray galaxies um, by looking at the N2, 205 micron tracer. Now, this is an expensive tracer, especially for faint galaxies in epochal ionization. Um, and so we didn't get a detection, but sort of our first estimate, first, first pilot to, to try and establish where, um, you know, is this C plus uh, a tracer of ionized gas or is it a tracer of VR uh, gas? Um, if we had find a detection of, of N2, um, and if we look at where um, the ratio of C plus over N2 in, in local, the the Milky Way, in the H2 regions of the Milky Way, um, we expect a pretty uh, low ratio. Um, we can um, rule out the three sigma in this uh, low ratio pretty well. And so we believe that you know, it's more likely that like most local galaxies, C plus is an epical organization is dominated by PDRs. So it allows us a little bit more to, to interpret what, what C plus is telling us. Um, another line that we're interesting in and that we're trying to interpret is the, the 0388 line. So this is work led by my student, Joris Wittstock, who is at the University of Cambridge. Um, and what we've been doing is looking at um, two tracers of the, the O3 emission. So we know from Spitzer, we have the O3 sort of indirectly inferred from the Spitzer photometry. Um, so we have the equivalent width of the O3, 5,008 um, doublets plus H beta. Um, and we have some measurements of the, the O3 line. Uh, as a function of star formation rate. So two traces of the efficiency of, of O3. Um, and so in general, we know that already to reproduce sort of the high equivalent widths of these sources with these very young ages. So we have, um, so we're modeling here with cloudy um, young grids of one to five mega years. Um, one of the things that really stood out to us when we do the modeling is that the only way to really reproduce the efficiency of O388 um, is by going to really uh, low, really um, pretty low electron densities, um, relatively high temperatures, and particular high uh, oxygen abundances, right? So um, the O3 over uh, O388 line over the O3 5007 line uh, is both temperature and density sensitive. Um, as we go to higher oxygen abundance, we go to lower temperature and this um, allows us to have a lot of O388. Um, this is not necessarily what we expect if we look at you know, the typical properties that we expect for high of galaxies based on simulations, but also looking at maybe local analogs of galaxies. Um, we expect electron densities that are a lot higher and also um, oxygen abundances that are a lot lower. So the typical, um, you know, um, the typical range O3 88 over star formation rate, the efficiency of O3 is somewhere down here, which is almost um, about 0.5 dex of set from, from where we find O3. Right? So we find these galaxies to be extremely efficient in producing O388 uh, emission. That isn't completely explained if we look at the typical properties that we assume um, these galaxies have. So I guess you could um, come up with two solutions, either you know, these galaxies are already much more enriched than we knew. Um, and hopefully, uh, James Webb is soon going to give us the answer if that is the case. But it is interesting to think how can galaxies that are so early on that aren't very extreme, the sort of normal star forming galaxies, how can they already build up so many metals? Um, you know, this is 800 million years after the crime. So that's quite puzzling. Um, another option is um, we know that some dwarf galaxies um, that have been Surface so Herschel also have quite high O3. And one of the explanations um, that are given for those galaxies is that maybe um, there's systematic changes in, uh, in the ISM such that a lot more highly ionized photons escape the H2 regions. So there's a larger diffuse um, ionized medium 
in the galaxies. And so basically what we might be seeing is evidence that ionizing photons are escaping their birth clouds um, and um, you know, making it out of the galaxy. So that has, again, an interesting implication if you think about um, the epicofrenization and how to ionize the universe. If we're looking at O3, um, that is sort of like a smoking gun of, of ionizing photon escape. So either way, um, you know, we can at the moment distinguish between these two scenarios. But either way, I think O388 is telling something really interesting and really unique that um, nothing that we will get from James Webb will uniquely tell us because it's sensitive to different gas, much more diffuse um, and lower temperature gas. So there's some really um, neat things that Alma is telling us. So one more thing that we can look at um, is sort of, you know, even though we have only a few beams, we can start to look a little bit more at the structural properties of these um, lemon bright galaxies. Um, so these are, uh, again, two of the pilot sources that we, um, that we studied. Um, and we can see here the, the, the extent of the C plus emission and the extent of the, the O3 line. And in particular, if we look at the galaxy on the left, one of the things that we see is that um, O3 tends to much more closely follow the um, the UV light or the, the bright UV unobscured clumps, whereas C plus is clearly um, following much more diffuse, much more faint um, extended UV emission that we're only seeing here because I'm stacking all of the HST bands available. So in both of these Lyman break galaxies, there seem to be faint UV winds. Um, and the C plus seems to be really good at um, um, tracing these sort of UV fainter regions. So what's going on, for example, in this galaxy. So this is, again, it's a, a, a typical galaxy uh, or a normal galaxy at which you have seven UV star formation rate of 20, uh, your star formation rate of 40 or so. And if we smooth the UV um, to the HST imaging to the, to the Alma beam, um, we can see that the UV is very compact, but the dust reveals a much larger star formation rate to Western form. So this view that we have, the compactness of the uh, the galaxies isn't always um, correct. There might be a much larger galaxies underlying. And what we're basically just seeing is it's a few um, UV bright um, star forming clumps within this, this bigger galaxy. And clearly C plus is also tracing much more um, on a much larger part of this ISM, um, similar to the dust. Right, and so what this reminds me of is maybe um, this is a a local compact dwarf galaxy. Um, and we can see that the galaxy is a lot bigger, but there's one particular part where um, there's a very recent birth, a very um, young star formation, um, the subshared star formation. And so the UV view would only give you this you know, small part of this entire galaxy. Um, and so if, if these high redshift galaxies are similar, and we assume that you know, the dust is tracing the mantles, um, it suggests that maybe there's been a lot more episodes of star formation that have taken place for this galaxy. Um, but we're basically, you know, in the UV, we were outshone by this very recent um, burst of star formation. Similarly, um, we can see how the, the ISM changes in the O3 to C plus ratio as we go from the UV um, clump where you have these very high O3 to C plus ratios to um, lower ratios in the, in the dust obscured one. And one of the things that might suggest is that we're not just looking at um, gaps in the in the dust distribution, but that there's actual physical changes happening that you know these, these systems are a lot more complex. Um, it's not that there's a uniform um, star formation rate in some um, place of the galaxies have managed to clear their foreground dust screen and therefore we're able to see the UV. Um, there's actual chemical changes as we go across the galaxy. So a little bit more about the dust that we can learn. Um, unfortunately, in Bens 8, where we get the O3 data, um, we don't have a dust detection for this particular galaxy. Um, but we do have a uh, continuum detection in, um, next to the C+. Um, but this is, uh, does already sort of give us some information, for example, the, the temperature of the dust. In this particular case, it's actually um, we're able to rule out three sigma quite a few um, high dust temperatures. And this wasn't exactly what we were expecting. If you look at the, um, trends that 
we can extrapolate from lower redshift to see from redshift zero to redshift six or so. It tends to be mainly rising trends in the, in the peak of the CD curve people have observed, right? And whereas the galaxy that we're looking at here is actually you know, way down these distributions of lower redshift galaxies. Um, and also, if you think about the physical picture, um, you know, we, we're looking at galaxies that have higher high specific star formation rates and typically at low redshift, expect a lot of dust to be, you know, if lower specific star formation rate, a lot of dust is away from star forming regions and therefore they're generally weighted towards cooler dust temperatures, whereas at higher redshift, a lot more of the dust is hot because it's close to the stars. So higher redshift and higher specific star formation rate, really, you expect hotter dust temperatures. And this is not actually what we're finding so far. It's still with upper limits and we need a lot more bands to actually get the dust curve um, completely. But so far we've, we're finding some really intriguing um, you know, counterintuitive results um, and we still need to understand. Um, so um, should quickly go through this last section quickly, but the last thing we can try and do is try and get a little bit of information on the kinematics of these sources. So again, these first two pilot sources um, that we observed with C+, you know, we have a few beams across the source, with, so we can sort of start to look at the, the velocity fields of these galaxies. And these two galaxies tend to have a very smooth, very regular um, uh, velocity gradient across the source, which doesn't always happen. There's a lot of galaxies that also already at very low resolution looks mu look mu much more chaotic. And if we look at, for example, the HD imaging of the source, there's no evidence for merger. Um, and also, if you look at the line, there seems to be one compact line. Um, so rather than assigning um, you know, this velocity gradient to maybe two merging components, uh, it is possible that we're already looking at rotation within the galaxy. And indeed, both of these galaxies have now been followed up with higher resolution AMA observations. Um, and we can still see, you know, there, there's for one of these galaxies, there's somewhat of a breakup, um, but we still see a really nice regular velocity gradient across the source, um, and in this case as well. So that suggests indeed that we might already be looking at the first of rotating disks. And that allows us to derive sort of a rough dynamical mass and compare that to the stellar mass. Um, and in general, what this gives us um, is very low stellar mass fractions, 50 to 50 percent or so. And so this means that stellar mass isn't the dominant um, component, so presumably the gas mass is what dominates these systems, which is quite similar for the kind of um, uh, stellar mass fractions that have been found in HF2 or 3 or so in, in normal, normalish star forming galaxies. Um, so we're likely looking at gas rich, um, you know, maybe a bit messy, thick disks um, with high redshift. And so with the Rebel survey, we're should be able to now um, do this a bit more of a larger sample. And indeed, um, we see a very rich variety of, of kinematical um, signatures. So we see sources that are definitely candidates for rotation. And then there's sources where there's, um, we don't see the nice, smooth, regular uh, velocity field, or we see an inversion. There's definitely either mer merger or maybe dispersion dominated sources here. Um, so we're now in a position to, you know, we've, we've done a couple of these studies um, of looking at the physical properties of these galaxies, um, just a few of these pilot sources, but we're in a, in a position where we can start doing this for larger samples and we build up um, you know, a bigger picture of the, um, the physical properties of these galaxies. And just looking at the kinematics, um, this is some of the modeling that has been done within the, the Rebels collaboration. Um, you know, and the, the results that we find for, you know, already um, seeing these early disks might be consistent, consistent with some of these simulations, which suggest that galaxies, if they're low mass, they might have you know, formation phase, which is still you know, very compact. They don't look very regular yet. Um, then as they start building up there, you know, some fraction of the time, they will be in emerging phase. So you will see irregular um, uh, velocity um, fields across the galaxy. Um, but in between mergers, there's enough time that you know, a galaxy goes into a kind of kinematically more quiescent phase um, where actually regular disks do start to uh, appear. And you expect this especially sort of at the bright end of the UV luminosity function um, where we're looking with rebels. So sort of these brighter, somewhat brighter galaxies, still normal galaxies um, in their star formation rate, but 
the bright end. Um, so yeah, it might indeed um, be the case that we're already looking at some of the first disks in the new universe. Um, so I see um, over time maybe. So I'll just put up my summary and I'll take questions here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting. Very interesting good talk. Uh, let's see if uh, we have, uh, yes, we already have uh, some uh, uh, hand raise reason. Uh, Eva, yes. Uh, hello, I really enjoyed the talk. Um, I have, uh, as a bit of an outsider in this very high redshift uh, uh, sources, I have this uh, question relating to the redshift two, which I understand a little bit better. So how do you uh, compare these uh, smoothly rotating sources that are also gas rich to the gas rich, very clumpy and messy galaxies at redshift two? How do these galaxies manage to stay rotationally supported with such a high gas fraction? Yeah, um, so in, in general, I think as long as these um, galaxies, you know, if, if they smoothly accrete from the cosmic web, basically they build up a disk quite quickly. So even if they're, they're, they're um, somewhat chaotic, um, as long as there's continuously new gas accreting, accreting, that will settle in a disk and it can do some fairly short time scales. At least this is what I get from the simulations. So even, you know, this is a very turbulent time. So some fraction of the time you will see um, chaotic um, sources. Um, but, you know, the, the gas accretion is really rapid um, at the moment. And so you don't need a lot of time to build up a new disk after um, you know, um, a galaxy has um, become unstable, if that makes sense. That's what I get from it. It does make a, some sense, as, at least as far as we know from uh, about that redshift. So, thank you. Okay, uh, Vasilis. Uh, hi, Renski. Excellent talk. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I, I wanted to ask you a, a sort of like basic question that I always had, and you, I'm sure you've thought about this as an expert. Uh, in all these analyses, what uh, for Lyman and Bray galaxies, I mean, you typically compare either the continuum or the lines uh, at the UV with the far infrared properties, which is the C plus, right, in this case, or the oxygen lines. So my question in general is, how solid are the SEDs that you use not you in particular, but people in the field use when this type of comparisons are being made. Because as you discussed, uh, you showed already that, you know, these systems are clumpy. So what you observe uh, in the UV continuum may be different from uh, the origin of the C plus. Uh, so, but, you know, as an aggregate, th this happens typically in galaxies, right? But uh, as an aggregate, this may be more, uh, uh, peculiar if we have very luminous systems and all these studies are basically flux limited studies. So do you think that uh, our understanding using uh, either models, SED models or uh, uh, the extinction uh, of these galaxies uh, in a uniform or a clumpy screen are solid enough for uh, people to make uh, to draw conclusions about the properties of those systems, in particular when one uses also the C plus to estimate star formation rates, and as Tanya has shown, uh, there are uh, limitations on that as well if you don't have information about compactness and whatnot. Yeah, so the fact that we're only just starting to sort of see, you know, a bit more of the, the structure of these galaxies, right? We before we've had so little information on these and. Um, you know, we, ideally we want more high resolution information. But yeah, so far we see quite a few of these sources that just do seem very, you know, um, the, the dust and the UV is quite separated. They're not simple 
think we originally thought they might just be compact galaxies and need a foreground screen and they're pretty, you know, we made pretty simplistic assumption. And this no longer is the case, you know, the UV comes from maybe different regions or maybe also the O3 comes from different regions than the C plus comes from. And so it becomes, yeah, it needs, we still, we are still modeling them, you know, as like the integrated lines and using everything. Um, but they're clear, yeah, clearly there are limitations to that. And in an ideal case, I, you know, with, with James Webb, hopefully we'll get a few galaxies with eye view. We'll be able to actually do this pixel, pixel and find out how large, you know, the, the errors, really the systematics are on these galaxies from, from these, these assumptions that we made. You know, we would just integrate all the lights, um, even though there's clearly separate components that have like very different properties. Um, I think almost, well, yeah. There's, yeah, I don't know how large the, the offset, you know, we, we can clearly learn something by looking at, you know, general properties. We are already learning that some of these galaxies have more dust than others and that there's these huge variations. Um, but the detailed modeling is going to be very, very challenging. Um, and it's almost like if you, you know, suppose we're going to do a lot of split spectroscopy with JWST, depending on where you slit lens you're almost learning more about that particular star forming region than actually galaxies as a whole, if that makes sense. So you almost have to treat it as, okay, we've learned something about UV bright star forming regions then rather than we've learned something about the full galaxy because um, it's not clear that we're actually probing the information of the full galaxy. Um, yeah, so I do think about this a lot, but I don't have the answer yet. <laughs> like, Okay. No, no, it's if it's an open issue, it's still uh, it's still an yeah. answer. So yes, I'm happy with that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vasily. And I think uh, also not only in terms of uh, spectroscopy, uh, JWC will help, right? But uh, also just photometric data yeah. in the red frame near infrared. Yeah. will help a lot with the with the CD modeling yeah. right and I mean the rest of near infrared will already move towards MIRI so well, learn a yeah, MIRI. we're basically going to see the rest from optical I even there I'm a bit worried that, um you know if you have a recent burst and it's only a local one whereas the galaxy is bigger that you will be you have an outshining problem in the rest frame optical still that you yeah, so it, your integrated light at least gets so dominated by the most recent mm. bursts, and it's so difficult to learn about everything that has gone on, you know, before that recent burst. If that makes sense. So still worry even mm. there, but yeah, um, yes, we'll was, definitely learn was, a lot more. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I, I was more thinking in terms of uh, you know stellar masses that probably right now they are. A bit unconstrained, I imagine. Uh, you know, like one micron res frame or one point something micron res frame that uh, will help a lot with those. I don't know if it, in terms of detections, are. Salamas will help with. us a lot also at the moment. You know, originally we started looking at the Spitzer in the hope of getting the stellar masses, and then we learned that so much of these bands are dominated by emission lines, even though they're fairly broad bands, right? Yeah. Um, and so just having things like medium bands to actually understand what the what the continuum is doing will help us a lot um, because it's just such a mess at the moment. So much of these, they're so young these systems that so much of the emission is dominated by like the recent, whatever recent star formation is going on. Yeah. True. So are, uh, are they modeled by a single SSP or, uh, or, or you need a more complex history? We, we've in, for example, in Rebels, we're doing a few things. We've had sort of the very simplest thing is um, uh, constant star formation. And then we have um, one model that does a recent burst plus a delayed um, exponential. And then we have one model that does um, tries to do non parametric star formation histories, you know, sort of in three bins or something. Um, the differences can be up to a dex in stellar mass. <laughs> That's painful. Not for all of the galaxies, yeah. uh, for the young galaxies. When, whenever you see evidence for these emission lines, 
the different methods can vary a lot. Whereas if you go to galaxies that seem a bit more uh, settled, then the differences are more yeah. like a few times, you know, so it's... Well, it's such a short period in uh, time, right? Like less yeah. than a billion years that, uh, yeah, there are many combinations of histories that can more or less, <laughs> given the data, get you to the yeah, exactly. right, correct answer, yes. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if uh, we have uh, anyone in the audience that wants to ask something. No? Then maybe I can ask a couple of questions. Uh, I, I was very intrigued when you said that uh, you detect, so how is that uh, brighter UV sources? Uh, you were getting higher C2 to UV uh, ratios, right? Yeah. Which is a, yeah, which is a, yeah, kind, kind of, I don't know, just by, you know, counterintuitive in the sense that uh, you have something that increases and then you put it in the denominator of something <laughs> and you would expect that uh, at least uh, the the ratio would decrease or keep being constant, no? But uh, you say that you have even uh, more, uh, uh, let's say, uh, luminosity in the C plus line per luminosity in the UV as you go up in, in UV brightness. Yeah. So that's a uh, that's. Very yeah. remarkable. Yes, I would. So do you have yeah. any insight of why why you are detecting this? Well, that what we believe is that yeah. So we believe that we're just looking at we're, we're statistically probing a sample that's more likely to also be dusty. So we're looking at just higher star formation rates. If you go mm -hmm. to you know, in general, there will be some correlation with C plus and star formation rates. And if we go to higher C plus, uh, higher UV, we're also more likely to see more IR. But there's a large scatter, obviously, because sometimes, you know, the uh, the dust obscures the UV. But so the 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 way um, you then understand it, or is that there has to be quite a significant fraction where the dust and the UV aren't completely aligned, and that's why you know rather than with more dust you see less UV because it's obscuring it. You know, we're we're sort of maybe picking out a sample of galaxies where. You know, if you have a high star formation rate and even a small fraction of the star formation rate isn't obscured by dust, then that will already give you a really bright lemon break galaxy. So even if the total, you know, the UV is only 25% of the total star formation rate, um, if it's a high star forming, star forming galaxy, um, that 25% will still be a bright lemon break galaxy, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so that's what, what we believe is happening and that's why Rebels we were able to sort of make this efficiency step because, you know, obviously we're looking at brighter objects already and therefore you expect higher C plus and then the C plus over LUV ratio goes up. So the only way to really do an efficient large sample was to go really the bright end. And it's really where Alma shines at the moment. Um, and in a way it's good as well because this is not a regime where JBST is going to make a lot of progress because then just, yeah. it's not a wide field instrument. Um, so, so that's, you know, yeah, why, once we realized that, we were like, we, we can do this. We can do a real language program in the epoch of organization and be relatively efficient. I um, mean, 70 hours is not a huge large program as far as Alma is concerned. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I, I, uh, um, actually that, that may be, I mean, what you were uh, mentioning about the, the, uh, uh, having the UV and dust not especially coincident, uh, actually, that's what you would expect of, from a very patchy uh, uh, extinction in the galaxy, right? You would actually expect an anti-correlation between the UV emission and the and the infrared, right? Which is what I think I saw in in, uh, in one of your last uh, slides from the from this source where you have both. Uh, Here it is. No, sorry. Which uh, which slide? Uh, no, the, from the morphology. Uh, uh, yeah. When you were showing the UV and the and the uh, yeah that for example yeah. right that that you 
that you would expect actually in, in very, uh, in optically thick, if, if some of the region in the galaxy is really optically thick, you would expect an, an anti-correlation between the UV and, uh, and the dust emission, right? Because yeah. yes, you, have regions whatever you have, yeah. yeah, yeah. So basically that would tell you that uh, you are not seeing the UV in this uh, like north uh, east part of the galaxy just because everything is being absorbed and radi radiated in what you see in dust as emission, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I th and I think that kind of uh, tells you that you would, if this is the kind of morphology, I mean, for this particular galaxy, but in this kind of environment, I think you would expect a kind of a departure from the, you know, C plus to a star formation rate relation, right? Because that uh, relation in local galaxies for normal star forming galaxies uh, is based on the fact that you have a direct proportionality between the, the you know, UV light that your stellar population emits and the amount that is reprocessed in the PDRs uh, by, you know, in, in like the, this more homogeneous medium, like the Milky Way type, right? But when you come to this super patchy uh, environment, uh, I would expect that you would, you know, go away from that uh, kind of yeah. relation. So I think, yes, exactly. And so also we found these galaxies that, the neighbors that are completely obscured, right? They just see dark galaxies. And so clearly there, you also have a breakdown of the relation of the, the EV. Um, mm -hmm. And so, but I think it's, be so because we do UV selection, we're almost always, by definition, I think at the bright end, we're always targeting galaxies like those that are, that with the patching, mm -hmm. there's no patchiness. We don't select them at all as Lyman break galaxies. So those are the galaxies we're missing. And so for our, the line member sample selection. I think that's when you get this relation of like, um, yeah. when there's more UV, you also get more AR just because, yeah. It's rare for galaxies to have just a lot of unobscured star formation. That's just really hard if you even, if you think about it, to make a galaxy that's no dust, but does have a lot of high star formation in the UV. Um, mm -hmm. And so all of these the high UV galaxies seem to be composite, of, well, some significant fraction of them are sort of composite galaxies. What is the typical uh, star formation UV to a star formation IR that you get? Uh, you know, is, is it comparable? Is 50-50? Uh... Yeah, oh, I should do I have extra slides on this. Um, so this sort of like lurk galaxies. So I think it's um, usually there's a little bit more. So for example, this galaxy is, you know, um, you ah, know okay. there it comes out in the UV. Uh, okay. I think. Oh, they have more. Uh, no, sorry. Yeah, but, um, yeah, I think. Yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's it's a bit like that. So we have one um, like Euler galaxy already. So that's like ninety percent um, dusty, um, and yeah, and then there's a large number of them that are not detected in dust. So these might be more like fifty fifty. So okay, I guess the median source is slightly just dominated in terms of star formation rates mm -hmm. in the yeah. um, But the UV does add a significant yeah. fraction. It's not you know, the total star formation rates. Um, okay. And one last question, if I can. Uh, in terms of the, because the original selection, right, is based on uh, some Lyman break technique, right? Uh, so, and you say that uh, some of the bands can be contaminated, well, contaminated, or can uh, have a contrib significant contribution from oxygen three, right, in the optical. Uh, sometimes completely so, dominated by oxygen three. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes completely. So, are these the? Is there some uh, a correlation between this excess in the optical with the O three emission that you get from Alma? Yes, we do have um, a little bit. Let me see if I can, um, I think I skipped some of these slides. Um, have, do we have these? Uh, this is sort of the typical LAR, it's not, uh, the, the galaxy. Oh, okay. Um, 
Um, so, for example, the O3 of a C plus is broadly correlated with the equivalent width of these lines. Mm -hmm. um, and also okay. here, so far, the O3 over, C, over S of R is also higher as oh, okay. it is higher, typically, mm -hmm. a little bit. Yeah. So there's some, okay. definitely some co correlations there. Um, I was, okay. Yeah. I was asking in the sense of uh, if, uh, because is there a way that uh, you could somehow, it's difficult, but identify whether there is an AGM there, uh, you know, enhancing O3 emission uh, mm -hmm. that, that uh, would increase the equivalent width and also uh, some, uh, you know, promote the detection also in the in the far infrared of the 88 uh, micron line. Yeah, I am considering that, for example, for, the, you know, this most extreme galaxy, maybe yeah. where we really, you know, maybe it's more likely an AGM than, for example, high, high oxygen abundance, because it's just difficult to imagine almost solar mm. oxygen abundance already. Not, not a very massive galaxy, maybe 10 to 9, maybe 10 to the 8. So they're massive, yeah. so young. Um, yeah, I, so I, I ha we haven't tried yet with AGN models. I don't, yeah, that's a good point. Um, I don't, I mean. Like if you, if you can with, uh, you know, uh, are there uh, ionization fields, right? For example, that would uh, uh, increase the ionization of your, what the I, well, the yeah. gas that you have with the models, right? Maybe that brings, uh, bring you to the correct area of the parameter space. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So one of the things I thought was surprising is, so a few of the, the assumptions we take for these grids, there are things we've learned from looking at the spitzers. So for example, we take a high alpha enhancement or the, the, the stellar metallicities are slightly lower than the um, nebular uh, metallicities, um, which, you know, which really helps to get the high of three with. So we, we don't struggle to necessarily reproduce um, these O3 equipment mm -hmm. with at the moment. Yeah. And so I was surprised that even with everything we've learned from um, trying to understand these equipment with and the extreme optical from the Spitzer, we are still not understanding the O388. Definitely. So because both and because both these lines are sensitive to like harder radiation, um, the thing that really is going to make a difference here, you know, sort of push the models up is is only the density and the temperature really, because those are the two the, the differences in these two lines really. Um, yeah, so that's sort of how I'm thinking about it at the moment. Like, um, you know, what, it's not clear to me that an AGN would change that ratio in a way. In a way, we, you know, we really want James Webb, we want to have the line and actually do the line ratio of the two. Because then, you know, things like hardness of the input spectrum just falls out. Um, and you just need to understand what you know, the density and the, and, the, and the temperature. And temperature in this case, in our cloudy modeling is directly related to the oxygen abundance that we assume. Um, you know, with higher, higher nebular uh, oxygen abundance, we get more cooling and so um, temperature goes down. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. Okay. So it's not, yeah, it's completely clear that the AGN will solve that, but yeah, it, it's a tricky one. Is there, is there I, I, what uh, I, I don't remember right now, the, the, the signal to noise of your, uh, of, uh, of the emission lines that you detect in ALMA, I don't know if you, you see any broad component or anything like. Can... So this one, this, this most extreme one has a broad, the O3 is broader, I don't know if I'm sure, no, I don't have, it's not sure. It's broader than the C plus, um, and I ah. think Usually it's the other way around because C plus is more extended, and so dynamic. Mm -hmm. you know, if you look at the dynamical um, broadening of the line, yeah. C plus is expected to be more extended, so that makes sense. And this galaxy mm -hmm. is an outlier in that sense. So that that is the reason why for this particular yeah. galaxy, I actually I'm considering it's an HM. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, it, uh, it, yeah, it, I, I mean, you are completely correct. Uh, but you would expect, uh, you know, because C plus in the end uh, is uh, it uh, is an, the most the best kinematic uh, tracer, uh, tracer mm -hmm. because it it's basically fine. arises from everywhere, as you say, yeah. no. <laughs> uh, so you would expect to be attached more to the rotation, etc. Maybe have a larger uh, width of a, of the line, but yeah, I mean it's. Yeah, you can, uh, you have uh, some tantalizing, no? Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, so. or, uh, maybe, yes. Yeah. Yes. Very, very interesting. Very, very okay. interesting. Yeah. But it's, you know, okay. otherwise it looks like a very normal Lyman Bright galaxy. So mm -hmm. these, these AGN have to be very faint or low. Yeah, pretty low black hole massness, I think. Or it's really, yeah, I, yeah. I don't know how AGN work in this regime where they're not dominating the total light. You know, otherwise the galaxy looks like a normal number. You know, I think uh, uh, you didn't meet uh, my PhD student still in the chat, <laughs> Roman Fernandez Aranda. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, he went to the uh, maybe or maybe we can stop recording because this is uh, irrelevant for the so <laughs> let me give you the official uh, thank you <laughs> and we can keep talking if, if you want so thank you very much uh, Renske, for uh, for uh, being here and uh, uh, we hope to have you maybe sometime in sometime in the future actually you know visiting Crete. <laughs> yeah I'd love, I'd love to. <laughs> and, uh, really uh, not just remotely so hopefully we'll have you here at some point. Thank you. That will be lovely. Thank you.